So I recently interviewed Dr. Erin Keneally. She shared that when she was looking at cancerous cells, that the, the, well, a typical cell has about 30,000 receptor sites. She said a cancer cell, when she looked at it, had about 64 receptor sites for glucose versus a healthy cell that should have four receptor sites for glucose. Have you seen something similar with your research? I haven't looked at the receptors so much, but certainly the glucose avidity is, is well known for uh, cancer. It would sort of make sense because cancers run on glucose much better than they run on, say, fat. It's not to say that they can't run on fat, they could. But you know, for a cell that's trying to grow, your best strategy is to use sort of um, any fuel. So that's why there are cells that can run on, you know, uh, protein as well. So um, there are cancer cells that could run on proteins, what you're saying? And fat, yeah. So and it's, and, it's and not, ketones? Uh, no, I don't know about ketones, but okay. on fat, there definitely is. And so some of these cells, for example, are so avidly sort of amino acid avid, you can do the similar sort of thing as you do with the PET scan with certain types of amino acids. So it's not exclusive to glucose, but essentially what it is, is glucose is the most easily available, um, uh, you know, fuel. It's the one that makes stuff run the easiest. So cancers do very well with glucose compared to, you know, trying to run on fat. I mean, it's like taking a car that runs on gas and giving it gas as opposed to, okay, let's give it diesel. Well, you have to make all these modifications and changes or, or let's run it on solar. Well, you can do it, but it takes a lot of work to change it, to do that, right? As opposed to, ah, let's just fill it up with some gas, right? It, it's the same thing for glucose. This, the cells are already primed, ready to go for glucose. So if you give it a lot of glucose, it is ready to go. Right? But if you starve it of glucose, it can change and, and uh, you know, go into these other fuels, fuels to survive. But yeah, it's, it's certainly, you know, that's one of the key things that we've, we've known for many years is that the uh, cancer, of course, picks up the glucose very, very avidly. Uh, and that's why you do the PET scan, which is the positron emission tomography, which is that you look for the cells that are taking up way too much glucose, and that's your cancer cell. So you mark the glucose with some radioactivity, you let you know the cells take up the glucose, and there's these cells over here that light up like a Christmas tree, right? They, they're just sucking up glucose like 10 times, 15 times the rate of everybody else. That's your cancer cell. No other cell in the body does stuff like that. So it's got to be a cancer cell. And then you get into the question, which is very interesting, of the Warburg effect as, as to why these cancers are sucking up glucose like no business. And that's a bit controversial. Um, you know, is it due to, you know, what Dr. Seyfried talks about, which is dysfunctional mitochondria? It's a possibility. I mean, there's still a lot of um, people, but there's a lot of reasons um, that it might, other than, you know, other than defective mitochondria, there's a lot of reasons why cancer might choose glucose as opposed to the other. I think one of the most interesting is actually the lactate. So when you take up glucose, your cancer cell breaks it down into lactate because it's, it's uh, breaking down through glycolysis as opposed to oxidative phosphorylation. So what that means is that you take the glucose and normal cells will burn it with oxygen. You take the glucose, you burn it with oxygen, and you get like 36 ATP, which is the unit of energy. If you take glucose and don't burn it with oxygen, through glycolysis, you get two ATP plus lactic acid. And that's what cancer cells do. So normal cells, they say, well, you know, let's take the glucose, burn it, you get 36. Cancer says, you know, we'll take the glucose and we'll get two plus some lactic acid. And they do this, like 80% of cancers will do this. And, wow. and you might say, why? Why, are, why is that happening? And that's the Warburg effect. So we know that it's happening. The question is why it's happening. And so there's one theory that says, well, because oxidative phosphorylation, this sort of you know, high octane sort of pathway where you get tons of energy out of the glucose is damaged because it happens in the mitochondria and the mitochondria are not normal. Um, that's one possibility, and that's what Warburg thought. That was the back in 1965 uh, when he published his uh, thing. The problem is that it's, it, and it might be true for some cases, but in other cases, 
they find that the oxidative phosphorylation is actually normal in some cancer cells, which means that they aren't using this sort of high octane pathway because they don't want to, right? Not that they can't, they don't want to. So then the question is why? And I think one of the more interesting hypotheses that's coming out lately is that it's the lactic acid. It's not that lactic acid is a waste product. Lactic acid actually helps the cancerous cells. And the point is that if you make a lot of acid and you dump it into the system, then you can impair the body's defenses. So you have a bunch of sleeper, you know, a bunch of rogue cells sitting in the middle. It's going to get attacked. The immune system and cells are going to try and wipe it out, right? So what they do is they take the glucose, make a bunch of lactic acid, dump it into the surrounding system and protect themselves by making that area, that local tumor microenvironment, highly acidic. And that's, a, that's another you know, great hypothesis. And I think that um, there is some experimental evidence to say that's true. Like, uh, and that would explain why cancers are using the Warburg effect. It's not some mistake. It's not just a mistake by the cancer because the thing is that cancer survives everything, right? Everything we can throw at it survives everything. None of this is by mistake. So if 80% of cancers are using the Warburg effect, it's because there's a good reason for that. And the question is, is that reason because of the lactic acid is highly beneficial to, you know, protect itself? And that's a good question. I, I think it's a, a reasonable hypothesis. The other thing, of course, is that glucose, you know, if you take glucose and you make 36, say 40 ATP, right? Well, you can do the same thing with, um, you know, Say, so if you have one glucose, you get, say, 40 ATP, just for easy numbers, with oxidative phosphorylation. Say you take 10 glucose or 20 glucose and make 40 ATP, you still got 40 ATP at the, at the end, right? The difference is that you take 10 or 20 times more glucose to do it, which is only an advantage when glucose is a, a, a scarce commodity, right. right? So in a condition where you have glucose everywhere like type 2 diabetes well that higher sort of efficiency one glucose equals 48 uh, 36 atp is not an advantage if there's like 10 million glucose sitting in your backyard right it, it, it's simply not an advantage because everybody says well it's so effective you know so much of an advantage because you get so much more atp like who cares if you have 10 million glucose in your backyard and i need to take 20 of them who cares, right? I don't care if it's a highly inefficient process. I have tons of feedstock, right? I have tons of stuff coming in. So therefore, in a situation like we have today, where you're talking about people who are over, you know, overweight, obese, hyperinsulinemic, type 2 diabetes, lots and lots of glucose, lots and lots of insulin, hey, there's no, no advantage to oxidative phosphorylation. So those are the sort of uh, things you know you have to think about in terms of cancer. A lot of unanswered questions for sure, but you know it's 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 interesting. These sort of things are very interesting to think about because they have implications. That is, hey, what if I limit um, my hyperinsulinemia and limit my glucose availability? That's going to be good right. for cancer if that's the case because the cancer loves this stuff. So therefore. I can do it and you can do it with nutrition, not some type of drug, right? Now the nutrition by itself may not be enough once you have a cancer, but before you develop the cancer, it may be enough to tip the balance towards not getting that cancer, right? So it's, you know, that's why it's important to know, to, to, to understand cancer a little bit.